Kuzangpula, welcome to Bhutani Learning. I am Peldanyema and this is a biology lesson for Key Stage 4, Classes 9 and 10. Before we get into the main slides, let us start by doing a simple exercise. I am going to demonstrate it from here and all you have to do is follow it. The first activity is called as clasping of the fingers. Now you can follow me. Please interlock your fingers and observe if you are having your left thumb over the right or your right thumb over the left. Did you? Okay. I'm very much sure some of you must have had the left thumb over the right thumb while some of us might have had the right thumb over the left thumb. It is impossible to have the left thumb all the time over the right thumb or it is impossible to have the right thumb over the left thumb all the time. That said, we are going to look into second activity. It is called as the tongue rolling. I'll try to roll my tongue and you may also try it. I am a tongue roller. If we say all of you viewers are tongue rollers, that is incorrect. Because some of us have the genes, which we call it as the dominant genes to express the particular trade while some of us will have the genes called as the recessive genes which cannot express in presence of the dominant genes. Now let us look into the everyday conversations we might have had had which are, uh, with our friends or you might have said this to your cousins or to your distant friends or even to your siblings. Something like you look like your father or something like you have acquired your mother's hide. Or you exactly look like your dad. Did you ever wonder on this kind of questions? Now, let us look at ourselves and try to find out the similarities that we have with our parents. In one way or the other, we look similar to our parents. We might have had inherited the curly hair either from your father or from your mother. You might have had the tongue rolling capability because your mother or your father had this gene. You might have had the left over the right thumb or the right over the left thumb because it is present in your parents and then you have received it. So what do you think makes us similar to our parents? Can you have some guesses? Well, is it by chance or is it by sheer luck or is it even due to your will? I'm sure you must have had come up with lots of assumptions but to all these questions or to all these puzzles we have a science behind and the science says it is the DNA which you can see it on the slide so let me do this on the board as well This biomolecule is important for making us look similar to our parents and receive the human characteristics. Uh, by human characteristics, I mean the Mendelian characteristics like the free or the attached earlobe or the widow's peak. Some of us have a hairline running straight across the forehead while some of us have a slight depression uh, right at the middle of the 
right at the middle of your forehead. This characters, these characteristics which we call as the Mendelian characteristics are inherited by us from our parents. What does the DNA stands for? It is deoxyribonucleic acid. Here I have got a 3D model of the DNA structure. You might, uh, you might uh, see it on the screen. If you look at the structure, these are like a spiral intertwined with each other. Anyway, we are going to deal with the chemical structures of the DNA in the later stages of the slide. For now, all you have to know is the biomolecule called as the DNA looks like this. And as said by the discoverers of DNA, James Watson, in this book, he clearly mentioned DNA as the secret of life. He named it as secret of lie because this biomolecule contains genetic information that has to be transmitted from parents to the offsprings. It also stores biological information which directs or which serves as the master information for the biological processes to function. So all these instructions are stored in the DNA. Hence, the discoverers of the DNA named it as the secret of our life. With this, let us move, let us move on to the objectives of my lesson. On completion of the lesson, you should be able to uh, we should be able to describe the structure of DNA molecule, tell the function of DNA molecule, and relate how DNA is associated with genes and chromosomes. Before we look into the structures of DNA, let us try to see as to how we inherit DNA from our parents. As you can see it on the screen, a father and mother. From the mother's side, there's an egg, the, uh, there's an egg, and from the father's side, there's sperm. Now, what happens there in times of meiosis, during the meiosis is the 46 numbers of chromosomes would be halved in both the gametes and when these two gametes fuse together, it would give rise to a zygote. Now this zygote would have 46 numbers of chromosomes. The egg cell would have 23 numbers of chromosomes and the sperm cell would have 23 numbers of chromosomes. When these two sex cells fuse, they would give rise to zygote whereby the normal diploid number of chromosomes, I mean 46 numbers or 23 pairs of chromosomes would be restored. When this fusion takes place, there is a genetic mixing up of the characters from the mother's side as well as from the father's side. Perhaps this is the main reason why some of us look like our father and some of us look like our mother. Having gone through how we have inherited or how we inherit the DNA from our parents, let us try this simple example. Do you think our nose contains DNA? 
All right, the answer is yes. Let's go on with the, let's go to the second figure and see if it also contains DNA. It is a stack of papers. A stack of papers do not contain DNA because this stacks of papers could have been chemically processed further which might have resulted in the DNA getting destroyed. That's why a stack of papers does not contain DNA. Let's try to look at the third figure. It is a leaf. Do you think it contains DNA? I'm sure almost all of the answers could be yes on this because this is similar to what we have seen in the first figure. Yes, a leaf contains DNA. What about the fourth figure? A rise in a bowl. It doesn't contain DNA because like explained, like explained for a stack of papers, the DNA could have been destroyed while boiling the rice. What about the fifth figure showing bones or it could be said as fossil bones? Yes, it contains DNA. Indeed, this is the reason why paleobiologists used bones and structures, ancient structures to retrieve the DNA and then try to study the evolutionary process, try to study how organisms have changed over the period of the time. The last figure is the fish. It's a living being, so definitely it contains DNA. Okay, have you ever given a thought or have you ever thought DNA can be extracted from living tissues like onion cells or carrot cells or cauliflower cells? Well, we can extract DNA from these living tissues. Here, I'm only going to touch briefly on what is called as the DNA spool. As evident on the screen, you see in a test tube containing a liquid, a whitish cotton-like structure, which we call DNA spool. This DNA spools may contain several copies of the DNA molecules. So this is how a DNA can be extracted from a living tissues. The Overall procedures we are not going to do because this is not within the scope of our discussion. Okay, the DNA in the test tube is called a spool because if you compare it with a thread, it appears like the thread has been wound over a structure over and over again which is why it gives the spool-like structure. Now that we have looked into the inheritance of DNA briefly and how the DNA can be extracted, let us move on to the structure of a DNA molecule. Let us watch the video to learn about the chemical structure of the DNA molecule. the chromatin inside the nucleus, we can see the structure of the DNA. The DNA has repeating subunits, and those subunits are called monomers, or nucleotides specifically. The nucleotide has three main parts, a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. In DNA, the name of the sugar is deoxyribose which is part of DNA's name. And there are four nitrogen bases in DNA. The bases are thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. Two of the bases are purines, which have a two-ring structure, and two bases are pyrimidines, which have a one-ring structure. Adenine and guanine are purines, 
Cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. I remember the pyrimidines are the bases with a Y in their name, just like pyrimidine has a Y in its name. A purine always pairs with a pyrimidine. And the slanted shape of the DNA molecule causes it to form a spiral or helix. Because DNA is double-stranded, we use the phrase double helix to describe its structure. There are four scientists who are credited with discovering the shape of DNA, and they are Watson, Crick, Wilkins, and Franklin. All of them received a Nobel Prize for their work, except for Rosalind Franklin. She died before the prize was given. Each of these scientists played a role in piecing together the structure of DNA. They learned that along the sides of the molecule was a backbone made of alternating sugar and phosphate molecules. On the inside, like the rungs of a ladder, are the nitrogen bases. Adenine and thymine form hydrogen bonds together. Cytosine and guanine form hydrogen bonds together. To help me remember which bases link together, I think of writing the letters. A and T both use straight lines. C and G use curved lines. I also know that A and T have two hydrogen bonds, but C and G have three hydrogen bonds by saying AT2, CG3. Silly things like this are actually a great memory tool. Strands of DNA are said to be complementary to one another because A will always be with T and C will always be with G based on the number of hydrogen bonds that they want to make. You can predict the complementary strand if you know the other strand. Okay, you have just watch the video. Now, let's summarize the video by going through the questions. I'll read out the question. If a cell is to human body, then dash is to the DNA. What do you think is the answer for this question? Okay, the answer is gene. And the next question says, a single strand of DNA contains the nitrogenous bases like G, C, T. And the complementary base pairs that the other strand is going to have will be? Please recollect this rule. A must always pair with, A must always pair with T, G must always pair with C, and T must always pair with A. For this question, the answer can be the complementary base pairs will be C pairing up with the G over there, and then C pairing up with the G and T pairing up with the A. The third question is, if the nucleotide sequence A pairs up with T, what would the base pair C pair up with? Can you think over the question and try to answer? Well, this could have been easily solved. The activity I have for you is this slide containing different structures. If you look at the left diagram, you see a circle connected with a pentagon or a pento structure. This pento structure is further connected to some structures. I would like to tell you this circle represents something from this 3D structure of a DNA. Also, the pentose structure depicts something from this 3D structure. And then, the green and the blue structure talks about the nitrogenous bases, which we have already discussed. Keeping this knowledge or understanding of your DNA in your mind, let us try to solve what this circle is, or what these circles are, or what this pento structure is, or what that green or the blue structure is. What do you think the circle represents? I'm sure some of you must have told the answer phosphate background. Well, that's the correct answer. The circle in my diagram represents the phosphate sugar. Let's try the next pentose structure, which is colored in red. Did you get it as deoxyribose sugar, or did you get it as the ribose sugar? 
I'm sorry if your answer is ribose sugar. It should be deoxyribose. The last structure that is represented by the green and the blue color. If it's A in the green structure, what do you think would pair up in the blue structure? Would it be G or C or U? If you choose answers from any of the trees, uh, any of these three bases, I'm sorry, the answer is wrong. A, if it's A in the green structure, it must pair up with the thymine, which, uh, which is the blue structure there. And then if you have picked up C in the green structure, it must pair up with the G in the blue structure. I hope with this diagram, you're able to understand or you're able to make sense of what the structure of the DNA looks like or what it is comprised of. Having talked about the chemical nature of the DNA, we came across terms like genes. So on this slide, I'm going to explain how the DNA molecule is associated with gene and how it is also associated with chromosomes. To do this, I'm going to give a simple demonstration from here. Take this stretch of thread as a gene and sorry, and another stretch of the thread as a gene as well. When I combine these two genes, it would form the DNA chain. So the simple analogy over here is the gene serves as the segments on the DNA. Now if I just take this as DNA now. Now if I wrap this thread over this and present to, present to you all in this form, it forms something like a spool. You see my thread is wound over the marker time and again. So at this stage we call this as the chromosomes because if you look at my diagram, uh, if you look at my demonstration over here, you will see thread wrapping around the marker over and over again. So this gives rise to a, sp a spool-like structure which we called, which, which is known as the chromosomes. Because this is highly coiled, in chromosomal term, we call this as highly condensed structure. So this is how the DNA is related or associated with the gene and the chromosomes. So what I have demonstrated right now is called as the thread modeling. You can take a short stretch of thread, can think of this as the gene, another short stretch of thread, join them and it makes DNA. So when this thread wound over and over again, they form a highly condensed structure called as the chromosomes. Let us try to break this further with the help of a diagram. What you see on the whiteboard is a chromosomal structure. Let me try to take a small part of the chromosome and try to magnify it. It would appear something like the telephone wire which is highly coiled. Again if I further zoom into this highly folded telephone like wire we would come across some ball like structures called as protein. Now Wrapping this protein would be the threads of DNA. So this is how the DNA threads are.
properly arranged in a microscopic structure like nucleus. Then if I again go a little bit further, then we come across the double, a double helical structure, like the one that you see on the white board. So this, let's say, let's take this small segment. So this small segment on the DNA is the gene. So what function does these genes carry on? Put simply, these genes are the recipes for making proteins by our body. I hope with my simple demonstration on the whiteboard, you have understood how DNA is related or associated with chromosome and genes. I would like to talk briefly about the function of DNA molecules in this slide. The first function is that, like I explained earlier, it serves as a seeker of life, which, which means that this is the genetic material of eukaryotic organisms like you and I, dogs, elephants, monkeys, etc. So what this genetic information does is, during the process of meiosis, from the egg cell there would be half the number of actual chromosomes, from the sperm cell there would be half the number of actual chromosomes. It leads to the fusion of the zygote, leading to the fusion of the zygote also means there is a genetic mixing up. So in a way the parental characteristics or in biological language traits are passed on to the offsprings or children. So this DNA serves as the seeker of life like I told you because it contains the genetic information that has to be passed from the parents to the or springs. Now please try to recall or please try to think over the nitrogenous bases that we came across while we were studying about the purine, pyrimidine, cytosine, uracil and thymine. Now what this nucleotide basis does is this ATGC comes in triplet. They come in three numbers. For example, ATC or CGG. This nucleotide basis comes in triplet and this codes for a particular amino acids. Hence, this is the reason why I told you genes serves as the recipes for the proteins. Recipes for the proteins because it carries the instructions as to what amino acid it has to encode. So in this way, DNA becomes the carrier of the information not only from the parents to the offspring but also for making the important biomolecule known as the proteins. With this, let us try to look at some of the questions. How is DNA related to gene and chromosomes? We're not going to discuss the answers here, but I'd like to give you a clue. Please recollect the structure of the chromosome and then from there using the analogy or using the comparison of telephone wire try to construct a relationship between gene chromosome and DNA. How do you think the instructions that are required to make different traits in human body are carried on a DNA molecule? Remember the nitrogenous basis like ATGC that comes in triplet? This comes or this serves I told you this serves as the recipes and these recipes would prepare or synthesize the protein. So this protein would manifest in a form of a phenotypic expression, meaning this would be evident in the physical characteristics like the hair pattern, the pattern of the earlobe, the interlocking of our fingers. This phenotypic expressions 
would be evident in this kind of Mendelian traits. The third question is, DNA plays important role in detecting crime suspect. Can you extract DNA from someone's footprint? If you think so, why? If you think we cannot extract, why do you think so? You can work it out on your own or even discuss with your friends. The fourth one is quite interesting. Assume that you have straight hair and your sibling has curly hair. What do you think brings up this kind of differences? For all these questions, we've already discussed the answers in a form of explanation. All you have to do is recollect on the lessons and then try to answer the questions. I'm sure you would be able to solve this. I come to the end of this lesson. Thank you for tuning to my lesson and then I'll see you all in my next class. Thank you.